Hello fellow Gwent players, it is me on the bottom right corner of the video again. And yeah, these kind of videos, they're gonna be a bit more frequent. I do think that with the meme cards videos, I I tend to run out of ideas quite quickly, so I need to, you know, make some secondary content like this or the last video that you might have seen with the experiment, the Gwent experiment. So I will also probably be recording these types of videos on stream. And on stream, somebody suggested that I make a review of all the leader cards that have been added to the game. And I think that's actually a pretty good idea. I think that's a very nice little uh, concept because the leaders are supposed to change the game. I will be rating them from, I think, 1 to 10. I think that's the best way to rate them. Uh, some of them you obviously know are going to be 10s, but others, there's going to be a bit of discussion going on. So maybe I'll even pop up the Twitch chat to see what their opinion is. And basically argue with Twitch chat or not. So we're going to be obviously starting with Foltis since he is the first on this. I do not have this in premium, sadly. I'll put my face right here. King Foltis, the first time a bronze unit on your side of the battlefield is boosted each turn, spawn a base copy of it at the bottom of your deck. Devotion also boosts a spawned copy by one. Now what this card was supposed to do is kind of give... Erland a bit of support, give Dunbanners a bit of support, and give Commandos a bit of support. Now the problem with that is... I do wonder what chat has to say about this though. Fault is 6 out of 10? Eh. I'd give it lower than 6 out of 10, honestly. See, the problem with uh, decks like Dunbanner and Commando, or it's not really a problem. It's the problem with Foltis' design, is that those decks play wide. They play very wide, and they play for carryover. Now, what Foltis does is they it gives it good carryover, but he needs to stick. And the initial decks, like... Commandos are decks that don't really run into Heat Wave or into Tall Punish. Whereas if you play a Full Test and your opponent plays a Heat Wave or a Lock, in that case, your 12 provisions, which could have been like a Draug or a Renew for Pavetta, are kind of wasted. So he fits the theme of the decks, but he's actually not good for the decks. The, the thing is, if he was like a 510, it'd be a whole different story. Because he gets value immediately, but his remove or like a five or like a six, I don't know. The thing is, like, it's so easy to heat wave this card. Like the opponent knows immediately that he has to react to this card. And you could have already set up like a few commandos. So if you get one commando with him, that's actually already decent value on him, but it's not the greatest value, right? It's still like quite slow and you're quite dependent to draw him in a deck that already is quite draw dependent like Dunbanners or the Commandos. So I would probably give him... I'd probably give him a 3 out of 10. He does have some good merits to him. I'm going to be very, very strict on these cards, by the way. Uh, probably not all of them, but like cards like this where... There, there was an idea, but the idea of the card itself is very flawed within the archetype. Because I, I myself have played some uh, Draug NR, and I felt like Draug, every single time I played him, he feels better than any other card in that deck. Whereas when I play Foltis in that deck instead of Draug, I get one extra provision. But the Foltis, I have to play in round one, first of all. That's never really that great if you're forced to play a card in round one. He's not a finisher. He kind of just gives you extra units, which can be good, but it's not really worth it for 12 provisions and a 7 body. Whereas, like, Drow can be, like, a really good finisher, or he can deny you, or he can die, deny the, the opponent, like, poison, or, like, help you with a bleed or something. I don't know. Yeah, so I think this card is a 3 out of 10, I think I said. Yeah, I think 3 out of 10 seems to be... All right, I think it's below average. It's definitely below average. Then next up, we have the Unseen Elder. You will hear the bats flying in the background. So deploy, give bleeding four to an enemy unit. At the end of your turn, give bleeding two to a random enemy unit without bleeding. Devotion bleeding on enemy units is also triggered at the end of your turn. So this card was supposed to like elevate vampires, but it kind of shows the problems with vampires even more. This card, I think, is really bad, by the way. I think, in general, this card... Sh 
like it, it, it is it is a Oriana, but it's also kind of like a worse Oriana because it, it's it's a five for God's sake. At five, pretty much anything deals with it. At twelve provisions, like its value is like it, it gets what six bleeding technically on your side of the field, two of which is going to be damaged already. So it plays for say seven tempo with an additional two. So it's a it's a nine, right? I'm not sure if my math here is correct, by the way. Now, if the opponent doesn't deal with it, obviously, that's that's very good for you. But even then, like, this card requires a really, really long round. Like, you can't play this as, like, your fourth last card or your fifth last card. You have to play this as, like, the seventh card. Or, like, sorry, not... Uh, the, the cards with, with like... You do, you'd have to have this, like, a, Adrenaline 7. Like, this card would be ideal at Adrenaline 7. And in a short round, it's terrible. First of all, like for 12 provisions, you don't want your card to be really bad in a short round. But this card's really bad in a short round. It is it is very synergistic with Vampires and Oriana. But all those cards really require a long round. And that is the biggest problem with that archetype in general. Is that you have to sort of build it around a big boy package where you have the short round as well. But there's no actual Vampires that work in a short round. You kind of have to just pick the best vampires. And honestly, I'd rather just play an Oriana than this because my, while this doesn't go tall, it's very easily removed with a lot of decks running five damage at the moment or just locking this card. Whereas Oriana already gets like a good amount of value on, on the deploy. While she go, does go tall, she just basically forces your opponent to have the tall punish. This kind of doesn't really force your opponent to have a tall punish. It just forces him to have a five provision damage card, which obviously, you know, it's easier than having a tall punish where the opponent might only have like one or two tall punishes in his deck where he might have like four or three locks, for example, or like four or three five damage cards or like four damage cards, which makes this card pretty weak. I'd give this probably the same rating as full test. I'd give this a three out of 10. Definitely a three out of ten. It, it it's it might even be a two, but I think three out of ten is fair for it. It can be quite devastating, but it just shows the problems with vampires very well. Next up is Emir. Now this one, this one's a. I, I'm actually quite sad about this one. Deploy, draw a card, then move a card from your hand to the bottom of your deck. Whenever your opponent plays a unit, give it spying. Devotion at the end of your turn sees a random one power spying unit. Now, me personally, I thought this card was going to be quite good because of its deployability alone. But the deployability kind of forces you to play this card in round one. Because if in round three you have a perfect hand, you have to mulligan for the fact that this card is in your hand, right? So that's already a bit of a problem. But, and the devotion isn't that bad either, right? Devotion and nerf guard isn't terrible. Now, what the problem is with this card is, like, the card isn't necessarily bad, but you can't really play this in a long round since it might clog your deck a bit too much because you have Usurper in that deck for sure, right? You're playing this with Spy, so you have to have Usurper as well. You have to play it early, but at the same time, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very slow setup card that you have to play as early as possible, so you give your opponent the biggest chance to actually also deal with it. So you kind of have to play this with Defender as well, which doesn't feel great. You have to play like the entire like spy package with it as well. You have to play like two emissaries, you have to play like Duchess Informants 100% because it gives this card value, but this card is only really good in round 1, which kind of makes me a bit sad. But the card is like kind of insane. Like if this card ever got a bit more support or like like, one good gold spying card, that's one power. Where it's like, if this card is seized or something, boost, like, adjacent or, like, boost the adjacent unit by seven or something. Something like that. If, if like, an effect like that is added to the game or if Spy just gets a bit more support, that is pretty nuts. And, yeah, I see in chat is, like, it's a win more card. And that's... I can't, like, disagree... Like I can't, sorry, agree any more than that. Like, the card feels like a very win more card. Because, like, Spies requires you to play Ramon as well. Uh, you have the Aristocrats, I guess. But, yeah, like, this card won't stick for longer than, like, four turns, usually. If not, it just gets heatwaved or locked. If it gets heatwaved, it's actually pretty good with Ball. But, like, the thing is with Spies, 
is like ball isn't necessarily that great with spies because it kind of eats up a lot of provisions for cards that could actually have better synergies with the deck but I would probably say, like, this card is a kind of slept on because I think people are focusing more on Joachim into Coup de Grasse, which I understand fully. Like, that combo is just kind of insane. Whereas, if they kind of nerf that, people will open up more towards a more spy-heavy deck, which could be an option, honestly. Like, it's not bad. Like, I've played with this card, and it felt really good if I played it in round one. And if kind of felt all right in round two if you fight against the bleed this card also is pretty good because you're kind of able to keep your ball or like keep other cards yeah in a short run it's all right and if you have like a good hand and you have to you're kind of forced to use the deploy on this and put a good card on bottom which also doesn't feel that great to be fair so I think it, it is an actually all right card it opens up a lot of opportunities I, I see in chat a lot of people uh, do like s suggesting like ideas and this card definitely has a lot of potential it's just right now the potential isn't really realized just yet like the, the deck would need a bit more support but i definitely think this is a right way in the like a, a way in the right direction for spy nilf card for sure like this card is actually very powerful i think i would probably give it a five out of ten it's a bit generous because i really like the design like, I really like the future that this card might have because it doesn't seem too oppressive as well with the 1Cs. So I think at... I think, yeah, I think at, at, at 5 out of 10, like, it doesn't even play for that much tempo, to be fair, though. Probably a 4 out of 10. Yeah, I'll, I'll change it to a 4 out of 10. It's a 4 out of 10. It's 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 a 4 out of 10. All right, next up we have Bruver. Deploy, gain one armor for every dwarf in your hand. Barricade at the end of your turn. Boost all dwarves with armor on this row by one. This card is amazing. This card, I think, is... Like, it literally is putting dwarves into tier two right now. I, I feel like this card is very good. It makes... Yeah, it, 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 it got better as well. It boosts self. Okay, I didn't know that as well. But yeah, this card really, really shines. It's It's... It, it makes dwarves just so much better. I'll actually also move Twitch chats here real quick so you can kind of read it better. Yeah, I think this card is just really solid. Like, it's obviously dependent on a bit of a long round, but there's a lot of good cards. There's a lot of, like, swarmy cards, like Justice into, like, Volunteers already gives us quite a lot of points. And your carryover dwarves also kind of work. Zoltan's company is quite insane with this. If your Zoltan sticks, it's pretty much game over if this card also sticks so yeah i think this card's pretty good like it, it can't like it's never bad like you have this you're playing dwarfs and you have this card in your hand it's just you're good right it, it's a good card to have in your hand and like against the bleed because dwarves really likes to bleed or like 2-0 that's kind of like the the, the way to play the game and it's, it's kind of perfect design for the archetype as i can read here from the comments i need to kind of move this a little bit and make it a bit smaller yeah that seems good better and yeah i think i think this card probably i i, I wouldn't say it's like the best card ever for Squatel since it only like synergizes with one deck but it does make that deck actually quite viable at the moment like you can definitely climb to pro with with dwarfs like that's definitely something that is possible and i think like i would probably give this card a solid like it's between a seven or an eight but i'm more tending towards the eight i think i'm very very pleased with this card yeah, Sultan's company is broken with this. Yeah, it is very good with this, for sure. Especially if you've got both your carryover dwarfs, one of them being Zoltan as well. And Defender as well. Defender protects this quite nicely. But obviously, yeah, the thing is, like, dwarfs has so much point slam and just kind of supports it as a super engine, which is kind of crazy because its deployability already is pretty good. So I, I, I'd probably give this an 8 out of 10. It's a very, very, very good card. All right, next up we have Cleaver. Cleaver, dude, this is, there's there's so much text on this card. I don't know where to put chat. I'll put chat here. Yeah, this is a good place to put chat for this card. So Cleaver, Intimidate, Deploy, Spawn and Play Shakedown, Increase this card's Intimidate by one for every adjacent crown splitter. Fee 4, Spawn a Cleaver's Muscle on this row. Now, a lot of people are saying it's a 10 out of 10. It says a 10 out of 10. It's the best bloody card they've ever printed. No, this card, this card is great. Don't get me wrong. This card is good. Like, very, very good. It supports an archetype that has not been, you know, that hasn't gotten a lot of support. And now they all, all of a sudden have this really, really good card. But this is not the reason why this card is good. The, the reason why this card is good right now is because of Drill. But And once 
Drill gets nerfed, this card will obviously be not as good. That doesn't take away from the fact that this card is actually just a solid amount of points with the line pockets leader ability. Because it immediately plays for a what? It plays for a five if it's next to a crown splitter, let's let's just assume you have one crown splitter on your side of the field. That's usually the case. So you play this for what? It's it's a four it's a five plus five. It plays for ten. Because you can immediately spend once. It's a 10 that puts a, a dwarf on your side of the field. And the next time you play a crime, this boosts itself by 3. It's obviously very vulnerable to resets. Uh, but it makes your board go quite wide. And it puts shields on your side of the field. Which can also be quite important against things like Skellig or so on and so forth. But, like, as I said, this card quite literally is the reason why... Tunnel Drill is a problem, and it's not really, okay, sorry, Tunnel Drill is the reason why this card would be considered, like, the best card ever, and I, I highly disagree with that, I think Tunnel Drill is, is more the problem than this card, I think this card's super solid, I'd probably give it an 8 out of 10 as well, just like Bruver, I think this card is a super solid 8 out of 10, like, it, it's just very good for the archetype, it gives your Gord an extra boost without you having to use a special slot, and yeah, that, that this card's just really, really good, honestly. Like, it's an 8 out of 10. I don't think I can give it a 9 out of 10. Like, it doesn't define the deck. It doesn't define the archetype. It's just a very solid card within that archetype. And that's why I would probably give it an 8 out of... Uh, an 8 out of 10. <laughs> Speaking English is a tough thing sometimes. All right, so next up... Uh, uh, once he shuts up, we'll talk about him. Uh, uh. Alright, he, he likes splashing his water, this guy. Ice Turisac. Deploy Bloodthirst to draw a card and discard a card. Whenever you discard a Skellige unit during your turn, summon from your graveyard to this road. Counter to Devotion. Also works whenever a Skellige unit enters the graveyard during your turn. Oh my. Um, now the card itself, its design is actually very fun. If you think about the discard package, you think about Coral, you think about Burn Up. But then you look at its devotion ability, and you realize there's this leader called uh, uh what well, frick I, I forgot it's, it's not patricidal fury it's it's got how do how how do I how do I forget that blaze of glory thank you very much blaze of glory thank you this is why Twitch chat is there yeah with blaze of glory this is an automatic twelve uh, sorry seventeen in round three. Now the reason why it's an automatic 17 for 13, uh, sorry, 17 for 11, is because Blaze of Glory does not require your opponent to have a unit on your side of the field for its ability to work because it it discards first and then damages a unit. So it already plays for 17 with that leader, and if your opponent played a unit, it, it deals 12. Now, why is it 17 exactly? Because you're going to play this with Yuta, with Blaze of Glory. There's no reason to not play Yuta with this card and Blaze of Glory. Also, I guess uh, Great Swords are pretty good with this because they're 10 damage. But yeah, 17 with 12 damage attached to it. So the, the 29. Like, that is just unfair. Like, you have cards like Dagger, which are 20 points with their leader. You have cards like Glusty, which are, I think, 5 plus... Wait, no, it's, it's, it's 10 plus... It's 16 with Leader. Then you have... What else is there? Like, what is, what's a Leader combo that, that exists within the game that has, like, this 20-point this ceiling? There's a 20-point ceiling Leader. But, like, yeah, Dagger and uh, Patricide of Fear are probably the best examples I can think of right now. There might be another example that I just can't think of from the top of my head. Uprising 7? No, Uprising needs some synergies. There's one that where, where it's, like, regardless of what you do, if you have the card in your hand, it plays for 20. I don't know. It, it, it's, it's, it, it, but, yeah, like, let's look at, like, the, the Dagger and Patricide of Fury combo is 20 points. It's random damage. This is targeted damage, which does make it a bit worse. But also it makes it better, right? Because you can just kill whatever the opponent plays. It it, it one-shots the defender. I mean, this card's just insane. I always, almost said the F-word. I'm not sure how much I edit in these videos, by the way. I, I might not edit this video at all. Just might just release it the way it is. But yeah, this card is kind of stupid. It is kind of stupid. It is very stupid. 
Yeah, like, it is so bloody stupid. Oh, yeah, like, okay, we have Patricidal Fury into... I mean, all of them are kind of in, in Skellige. Skellige has got some pretty good leader abilities, don't they? Like, there's no denying it. There's one leader you play it with. It's like, a da it's like Dagger. Dagger within Patricidal Fury... Not Patricidal Fury, sorry. Reckless Flurry is... It's just the one deck you played in. This card you don't play outside of Blaze of Glory, but within Blaze of Glory, you just have like this 29 card point card that can quite literally remove anything. If, unless it has shield, obviously, but then you just use your Brockvar Hunter or your, your Raiders, I guess, to ping down the shield. So, yeah, realistically, this card is incredibly unbalanced. It's a 10 out of 10. There's no denying it. I don't think anyone can deny this card is just completely out of this world unbalanced in any possible situation. Like, it's just too stupid to exist and it should kind of get nerfed somehow. Because I know the deck itself right now isn't tier 1. I do understand that. But this combo itself is just so absurdly broken that... Like, you can just climb to pro rank with just this card and the leader ability and just, like, a random bronzes around it. Like, it's just so good. I mean, obviously not as easy as it is because you need devotion, but still, it's 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 a bit ridiculous. It, it is it is a bit ridiculous. Also, when you have Bloodthirst 2 and you discard a greatsword when you draw it, <laughs> it's, it's another 10 points on top of the 29. So, yeah, chat does point that out. But, yeah, this card is... Completely broken, completely busted, and uh, should probably be fixed at some point. All right, next up we have Meave. All right, now we can actually move the chat a bit up here because Meave doesn't have that much text to work with. So, inspired at the end of your turn, lower the counter by one, counter three. When the counter reaches zero, boost all ally units by one. This card is bad. It's not as bad as it seems. I see some tens out of ten. That's obviously not correct. That's obviously being ironic or sarcastic. But yeah, this card is... Is it actually worse than like a 3 out of 10? Because like, yeah, okay. you have Okay, actually, yeah, this card's pretty bad. In, in, in context, this card's really bad. It gets locked immediately. You, your opponent has two c turns to poison it. Your, your opponent has two turns to kill it, to shoot it down. Uh, two turns because the, the counter will obviously go off in one turn. And if he shoots it down with damage, you have to boost this again. Like, you, you just have to boost it again. It's really, really bad. I wouldn't say it's a 1 out of 10. But it's very close to a 1 out of 10. It's a 2 out of 10. Because th if the card goes off, it goes off quite hard. Like, in the meme episode where I played this card, I didn't think this card was terrible. But the card is terrible. In in Like... If I could have played any other 10 provision card, I probably would have played, like, Baron or something instead of this. But, like, she synergizes with the Swarm. Yeah, it's probably, like, a 2 out of 10. Yeah, yeah, If this counter was 2, it's a different story. But at 3 counter, it is definitely a 2 out of 10. Then we also have... Oh! He won't let me speak. Let me speak, Mr. Crack. All right, we have Crack on Crate. Deploy, give two armor to three pirates or ships in your hand. Whenever you play a pirate or ship next to Crack, damage it and the lowest power enemy unit by each other's power. This card is kind of bad, but also kind of not bad. It's definitely not the worst. But it's also not the best. I see a 5 out of 10, and I probably have to agree with the 5 out of 10. Because pirates are... Like, they're so close to being good. They're, they're like four cards off. But the problem with pirates, and I've, I've said this in the meme cards episode where I played with this card, is that pirates are arguably one of the slowest decks in the game. Because their entire deck is based around, alright, every ship is like, alright, whenever you play a pirate to do this... And the pirates are like, all right, whenever you play a ship, do this. So it's like you have to like sequence in a really, really weird way. So yeah, I, I could, I should probably give this a five out of ten. Like I think the value on the armor and the fact that if he sticks, you can kind of like with first say this card's actually really good because if the opponent doesn't answer it, you could just like deal damage to every single one of the opponent's units without you actually theoretically losing too many points because of the armor. So I do think this card 
definitely has some potential. I think pri Pirates will definitely have some potential as well. It's just the problem with like the Pirates in general. This is, this is just another card you want to play as early as possible. This one you don't have to play that early. But if you can play it early, obviously you want to play it early. So, yeah. I mean, its value on the armor already is pretty decent as well. On something like a light long ship. To, or like a, a raider to keep it alive is pretty solid. And I think this card just is just kind of good. And also not good. So I give it a 5 out of 10. I, I think a 5 out of 10 is fair there. I think chat would agree with the 5. I, I, chat already agreed before I even said 5 out of 10. I think I kind of let chat sway my opinion there. But I think a 5 out of 10 is a very fair rating for this card. Next up is Eldane. Oh, wait. We got to listen to this one. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's good, that's good stuff, that's good stuff right there, that's good stuff right there. Alright, I'm seeing 9 out of 10, 9 out 9.1, 9.5. This card is, like, theoretically, out of all the cards that they've, all, all of all the leader cards, this card is the most broken out of them. Like, I know Iced is kind of broken, but he's kind of revolved around one leader, right? There's only one leader that really makes him broken. This card... In theory, is so broken. It's so undercosted at 10. And the fact that they buff traps makes him so good. Like, it's it's not tier 1, obviously. It, it isn't tier 1. But this card is just so good. Desi its design is really, really good. Like, really, really good. They, it, it, it enables you to play, like, uninteractive strategies... And turn that into points. And then turn that into more points with a Vernacio or like an Isengrim or like an Ellerin. So I do think this card is definitely a 9 out of 10. Now, uh, this might be a bias because I just love Scoia'tael so much. But my god, this card is so good. Like, it's actually... Like, the fact that this, like, puts traps... It's not just the trap changes. It's this card makes traps so good. So good. This is such a good card. I really, really like this card. Like, it's it's toxic design. But yeah, in theory, this card is probably, like, the second best, like, leader card to come out. Like, for it, because it's value, you have to look at it this way. You play two traps, this is already a 12. And your traps got value as well. The devotion is useless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's true, that's true. But, yeah, I mean... I would I wouldn't say that traps are bad in terms of provision value. I, I would say I would say they're still okay. Like and and the fact that they just get extra value through this card just is so bloody good. I really really like Eldane. Very good card. Okay. Oh no, I want the premium. Come on. Alright, we got the Detlaf Van der Eretten. Deploy, spawn Blood Moon on an enemy... Oh, okay, he's not done, he's not done with his premium. Okay, okay, now I think now he's done. So deploy, spawn Blood Moon on an enemy row for one turn. Increase the duration by one for every adjacent vampire. Order damage an enemy unit by one uh, with bleeding. Uh, death blow, spawn an Ekimara on this row. I think this card is the worst card that they've released. Like, this card's worse than Meave. That's just my opinion. I think this card is terrible. I think this card is honestly so bad. It's a 6 for 10. That deals 1 to a bloody unit. A bleeding unit. It removes the bleeding, first of all. A lot of times you want to bleed units with armor anyway. And like if your opponent plays like no unit veil stuff, this card is useless anyway. This card's terrible. I think this card is the worst of these leader cards. Like, honestly, it is. In my opinion, obviously, but it just is. This card's bad. In every sort of design way. Like, it seems crazy on paper to spawn a three-point unit when you death blow. But I've played, like, a few games with this card. I've never managed to get a death blow with this. It's so bad. This is a one out of ten. I think this card's actually the worst. This is worse than Meave. Like, honestly, like, Meave might have a cooldown, but Meave doesn't need, like, f a unit with bleeding and one health for it to actually gain its provisions back. It doesn't. Like, Meave just is better than this. In every single way. 
So this is a 1 out of 10. This is quite literally the worst leader card. Might be a surprise, but... Yeah. This is... Yeah, have fun versus traps. Chat says it. Have fun versus Kelly, dude. What, what are you going to do against Kelly with this deck? Useless. Useless. Like, this card's actually terrible. Like, un unplayable. It can't even deal one damage to just a unit. Like, it needs to be able to deal one damage regardless of bleeding or not. If it dealt two damage to a bleeding unit, that would make more sense, right? You're then also at the death bow. That Then it would be worth it, but... Cards is kind of bad. Cards is terrible. Literally the worst of the leader cards. It's just a bad Nithril. It's an overpriced bad Nithril. And even it's... Bl I mean, I guess you have the deployability. But you might as well just play friggin crimson curse for the 10 provisions like it's it's the same idea right it's the same effect technically you get a six you get a blood moon i mean this dies immediately anyway so also you get two vampires with the other one yeah crimson curse is just solidly better in every possible way this card is terrible quite literally the worst one of the new cards and then we have horse and junior it was laughing in my ear like that. Deploy damage boosted enemy unit by 6. Gain a coin for every point of excess damage dealt. Devotion also gain insanity. V3 destroy an enemy unit with 3 power or less. I mean, the problem with this card, like... People are saying it's a 2 art. Like, the thing is... Once they nerf lined pockets and buff bounty... People will hate this card. This card deals. Uh, this card plays for eleven on a boosted unit, and it can just eat it if you're playing devotion. I mean, it's very rare that you're gonna play devotion with it, but like it, it plays around armor. That's actually quite significant. Like you don't need to like your opponent does. Like it doesn't matter if your opponent's unit has armor. Brick against SK. Oh, that's true, actually. No, not, not if they play the Protector, though. Heimei Protector. Or TA, right? SK likes a bit of TA. Like, I think... Like, like, yeah, the card bricks in some situations, which feels terrible. Yeah, it feels bad if it bricks. It feels really bad if it bricks. But the, the condition makes the card playable. Exactly. Exactly. It's, a, it's an 11 deploy. It could be like a 5 deal 6. Which honestly isn't bad. It's just like this this card hasn't found a deck yet. Like once this card finds a deck, it, people are gonna complain about it. Because it's just a five deal six. Cause that's just good. Like guys, a five deal six is always good. Like there might be a condition added to that. But like if your opponent plays a Nausicaa Sergeant, you get a five you trade up to that by five points. Like how good is that? It slaps warm as there's so many things this card actually does. But it's just that Syndicate right now has that one deck that's really broken. And that kind of takes away the lights from all the other cards, like this one, for example. So I do think that Like the card isn't fantastic. I'm not gonna say it's like the best card ever. But I can't give it lower than a six out of ten, honestly. Like I think this card's still a very solid deployability. Like, I think the deployability... A 10... It's it's very rarely a brick, though. It is very rarely a brick. There is a lot of decks that run boosts right now. I think this card's pretty solid, honestly. That's just my, that's just my opinion, though. You could say different things, but... I think this kind of is just... A 6 out of 10. Alright, next up we have... Anna Henrietta. Deploy, replace your leader ability with a base copy of your opponent's leader ability. It might look insane, but it's kind of trash. It's pretty trash, guys. It's pretty trash. Like, it's so meta-dependent. So I, you, you can't really rate this card because this card will always be based off of a meta. If we have, like, a Patricidal Fury meta... And I'm always going to go off of SK examples because apparently SK will always be, like, around the Tier 1, Tier 2 area. But, like, again, uh, yeah, in an SK meta, it's going to be pretty good. Against the Syndicate meta, it's going to be pretty bad. Against the Skoetel meta, it's going to be aight. Against the 
monster method's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay against monsters, right? Ah, uh, no, overwhelming hunger is pretty bad though. Yeah, it's it's just a meta card. It's 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 there's nothing more than that. It's it's not. It's like it, it, you can't really give this card a rating because the card literally is different, no matter what you play against. Even with Royal Inspiration, you play the, you just play your leader ability and then play this, and you have a Royal Inspiration. It's pretty solid against Royal Inspiration, to be honest, though. I don't know, this card just feels so clunky. Like, it's a meme card. And that's all it is, really. Like, it's just trying to get surprise value. It could be good in, like, a tournament setting, though. If you know, like, what opponents are playing, this card could be very, very powerful. Yeah, it's very good in, against Nilfgaard for sure. Against Nilfgaard, this card's kind of busted, but Nilfgaard mirrors are always a bit crazy. So, yeah. I, I I mean, if I were to give it a rating, I'd probably give it like a 3 out of 10. But, like, that's just the average rating because, like, the average leader ability doesn't really synergize with this. Or it doesn't, like, live up to its potential, like, its provision costs. So, yeah, against Nilfgaard, obviously, it finds value, but against, like, Iraqa Swarm... Carapace. It's, I mean, Carapace is alright, I guess. Yeah, I guess Carapace is pretty okay. Yeah, who knows? I don't know. I'll, I'll give it a 3 out of 10. I'll still give it a 3 out of 10. Whatever. That's fine. And yeah, that was the review of the new leader cards. I think after a month and a half, which we've kind of been having with this meta, I think it's fair to assess these cards now, give them a rating, give them a proper, you know, review. And yeah, that's that's... The video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please leave a like, subscribe for more great content, and I'll see you soon.